Welcome everyone this afternoon. Um, good to see a number of people uh, in the room uh, and coming into the room to, to share in this uh, webinar uh, that um, we are doing about writing powerful articles for publication. Uh, my name is John Gunther. I'm the editor for the Evaluation Journal of Australasia. And joining me this afternoon uh, from the team is Jeff Adams, who's the uh, manager for the for the journal. Uh, the way that we'll structure this afternoon uh, is to um, introduce the team uh, and then run through the uh, the a set of slides that we've got there that talk about various aspects of publication. Uh, and at the end, we'll stop the recording and uh, there'll be an opportunity for you to ask questions if you want to. Um, so I shall begin. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge the country that I'm on today and the elders past, present and emerging. I'm on Aranda country from Bandwa, Alice Springs in the Northern Territory uh, this afternoon. Um, uh, it's great to be in this uh, beautiful part of, uh, of the world and um, great to be in a, in a place of such rich cultural heritage and, uh, uh, and beauty as well. Um, and if you'd like to let us know what country you are on uh, uh, this afternoon, then feel free to uh, just describe, describe that or write that into the, into the chat window as we go along. I'd like to just introduce you to the uh, Evaluation Journal of Australasia's editorial team. So uh, as I've said, Jeff and I are, are both uh, editorial team members uh, and a few of the, the team are not able to, to make it this afternoon, but uh, joining us on the team, uh, uh, Quadjo Ajusei Asante, who's from Western Australia, uh, Anthea Rutter, uh, who is uh, from Melbourne, Minghua Ting, who's from Singapore, and Yvonne Zarinsky, who's from New South Wales. Uh, and, and together we, we, we manage the, the publication process for uh, contributors. Uh, and... Um, uh, take your papers uh, into um, uh, the, the, the the portal and or you put them into the portal and we manage them until they're ready for publication. So um, it's a good team with a wide variety of different experiences uh, and uh, what we try to do is assign papers to people that have got particular experiences where that's appropriate. Uh, just also to acknowledge our editorial advisory board. Um, uh, I'm not going to read out all of the names that are on the on the list that you can see in front of you, but our advisory board uh, um, are responsible for doing reviews where, where we can assign them an appropriate paper. They're also responsible for providing advice and uh, a, a little direction uh, for us uh, as we as we progress forward uh, with the journal. Uh, we meet with the advisory board twice per year and uh, we provide a report back to them and, and they, they provide input and feedback about uh, how the, the, uh, the journal is going. Um, the, as you can see, by the names there. These are, are well-respected people that have uh, a lot of experience in evaluation um, and also experience in publications as well. Um, so we, we value their contribution to the journal and um, they make a, an, an important, they provide important input into the journal and its direction uh, for us. So the aim of this session is, is pretty simple. It's about how we, or how you can prepare a good article for the EJA, the Evaluation Journal of Australasia. And when 
I think of good in this context, I, I mean an article that is well written, widely read, and cited often. Uh, we, we are looking for, for a range of papers that uh, will encourage our readers to, to think, uh, to do their practice better, uh, and to engage in scholarly thinking uh, around uh, evaluation and uh, evaluation theory, evaluation practice. So think of this as an opportunity to think about, well, what could you do to make, to write a good article for the journal? Some of us um, may not be used to publishing uh, in journals, and you might be asking yourself, uh, why would I even want to publish? Uh, you know, you write evaluation reports. Uh, we do that a lot. Um, we, we write um, for all sorts of reasons, but why on earth would we want to actually have something that's published in a, in a journal? Well, I think there's several reasons why we would, might want to do that. Um, first, for, from a, a more general perspective, it's pretty important to publish because we want to build an evidence base about good practice, about uh, uh, the findings from our evaluations, about evaluation theory, and about other aspects that, that relate to the evaluation profession um, and, and the academic work that goes on around uh, publication. So it's very important from, from that perspective, just building the evidence base, but also, I find that uh, from a dissemination strategy perspective, sharing the learnings beyond the evaluand and, and beyond the commissioner is really important so that other people can use the, uh, the findings that we've got, use the thinking that's gone into our evaluation to improve their own practice. So I think that second reason is particularly important as well. And thirdly, I think uh, publishing increases the value of uh, our evaluation work. Uh, I find whenever I'm putting in a, an evaluation plan or a proposal, I always include the option at the end of the uh, of the project to to do some publication work, and I do this uh, uh, optionally because I know that some people don't want to have their work published. It might be uh, 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 private and 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 needs to be kept private but um, more often than not I find that there is something worth sharing from the evaluation work that we've done and I offer that to a client uh, often as a free option free in the sense of it's not going to uh, add additional cost but it does add additional value to the work that you have done and to the work that uh, your team might have done in the evaluation because it means that it's more accessible to the broader public. Now, there are, of course, lots of different journals in the market, um, and the Evaluation Journal of Australasia is just one of many. So why would you want to publish in, in this particular journal? Well, uh, for those of you who are members of the AES, which I suspect is most of you, this is your journal. Uh, there uh, is no other journal that uh, is uh, like it in Australia. There are other international journals that you can publish into, uh, but this is Australia's journal. Um, it does have the name Australasia in it, so it implies a broader audience beyond uh, Australia, but it is a journal for our membership. And, and so this is... Uh, it, it provides an avenue for you and me to share our findings with other members uh, and to, I guess, make our work known uh, to a much broader audience as well. So I think for, for those reasons, it's important to publish and it's important to publish specifically in the... Um, EJA as well. So anyone can, pretty much anyone can publish, whether you're a, um, a research student doing a PhD or a master's, or whether you are a policy professional or a, a, 
an evaluation practitioner, you might be an academic, it doesn't really matter. Uh, publication in our journal is open to anyone. And we do have a variety of different articles that can be accepted. And I think Jeff's going to run through the different kinds of articles that we, we would normally accept. Thanks, Jeff. Yes, so um, the, the journal really can accept a range of um, articles. And essentially, um, there's, there's two main types that, that we get from people. One is um, academic articles that are really going to be focusing on developing new theory. Um, and they may also include um, reviews. So that could be a systematic review um, of a hot topic in relation to evaluation. I think the important thing um, for, for all the submissions and types of articles is that the, the word evaluation is in the title of the journal. So it really needs to focus on evaluation. Um, so we get some quite nice articles about um, topics. So, so, for example, a health promotion topic, but there's nothing evaluation in it. So we need to kind of make sure that there's um, a focus on evaluation. Those um, academic articles um, might, for example, um, include a mix of qual qualitative, quantitative, and mixed methods um, kinds of evidence. Um, and so they'll be based on what's um, been found in that evaluation. The other kind of um, main type of article is a practice article, which is focused more on you know what what has been learned in the in the practice of doing an evaluation. So it could be, for example, reporting on um, some innovative um, evaluation practice or some techniques that were put in place, or perhaps some challenges that you faced and and overcome within your ev evaluation. We're kind of um, pretty open to any topics, and you can see on the list um, on the right there, there's a list of kind of hot topics. So some of the, the key things that um, that we think are important in relation to evaluation, but you don't really need to be restricted by those. If you've got um, something that's interesting um, that you think other evaluators want to hear about, um, then we're, we're you know really open to, to receiving articles about that. So I think, you know, um, John will probably talk about this in a, in a minute, but one of the things is to think about who are the readers of, of the journal. And essentially, they're people like you. Um, so there's a bit of a range. You know, I, I know I can see some in the in the chat. I can see that there's some academics. I can see that there's some practitioners. I can probably work out there's a couple of students in there. Um, and I can also see that there's people internationally um, in, in the in the session today so there's a pretty broad audience but we of course we're all focused around um, evaluation thanks john so the the different types of articles what what um, we've provided here is a bit of a structure um, to help um, guide what um, a good um, article might look like I think what we would suggest that, especially when you're starting out, is to try is to kind of follow the, the tried and true method of structuring journal articles. Um, and if you if you um, you know look at this list, I, I won't kind of go through through everything um, on this list, but often what we're going to find is that um, an article that kind of covers these uh, types of areas within the um, within there, you know, what, what's being presented is, is more likely to be kind of um, sort of acceptable to readers. Um, that's not to say that you can't vary it, but I would always start off with this kind of basis in mind. Um, and if you have a good reason to change things, then that's fine. But um, you, you don't really need to be that creative in the way that you present an article. Um, so... For example, if you're doing um, an, an article um, around uh, basically using qualitative findings, what you need to do to start with is to talk about, you know, introductions, so kind of a bit of scene setting. Um, it doesn't need to be extensive, but kind of, um, you know, where does this fit into the into the grand scheme of things? And you might sort of expand on that by looking at some literature and some evaluation theory. Then you're going to talk about the methodology and the approaches that you actually use to, to collect your, your data. 
Um, and then you might have a finding section and then a discussion and conclusion section. So you can see it's kind of pretty, um, a pretty standard kind of format. Um, so again, just using these kinds of formats will help you structure your, your article. I think to me, the important thing about an article is that, um, is to think quite clearly about what you're trying to communicate and think about that before you start to write the article. So one of the things that the, um, the journal asks is that you, when, as well as providing an article, you provide um, a few dot points for us at the at the front of the article to, to say things like, what do we already know about a topic? And what's new that you are offering in your article? And I think that's um, a, a kind of really good thing to think about is what are you trying to communicate? Often when we do an evaluation, we've, done, we've found out a whole lot of things. I'm, I'm, For example, I'm just writing an evaluation report now, and it's one of those horrendous ones that's 250 pages long. Now, we can't put that into a journal article. So if I was going to use that, I'm going to have to think about what is the key thing I'm wanting to, to get across to the audience, and I'll focus my article around that. And I could use one of these kinds of frameworks to help me um, set that up. Thanks, John. Oh, no, sorry. That's uh, over to me now, is it? That's right. Yep. Yep. Uh, so before we get into what makes a, a good article, um, I just want to focus a little bit on what makes a very ordinary article. Um, an article is not the same as a report. And uh, what makes a good report is not the same as what makes a good uh, article. Uh, Jeff's mentioned the size uh, is, is one issue, but um, an ordinary article just reads like a re report. It, it states facts. It's got lots of dot points. It might have diagrams that explain things, um, but that's not necessarily what you need to have in a an article. So an article that's got lots of dot points and lots of diagrams is uh, uh, can be very distracting for a, an article reader. Um, and you're better off having less rather than more of those kind of things. Um, as Jeff's mentioned there, that, that that question about what don't what don't we or what didn't we already know uh, is important. The so what question that comes out of an article. So when I'm looking at a at a manuscript that comes in, um, and it tells me about findings from an evaluation, for example, my question at the end of that is always going to be, well, so what. And that so what should encapsulate something that is new or different that this uh, study has found. A third thing that makes a, an ordinary article is if it expresses a lot of opinion and it's just a sales pitch um, that says how wonderful we are as a, you know, we might be trying to sort of uh, describe a, uh, a process that we've developed, a framework that we've created and, um, it's then if it's full of opinion and it's full of sales pitch messages, then it doesn't read like an article. An article should have something that's more critical and more nuanced in it. That doesn't just present one point of view. It, it presents some balance. Um, so, so avoid uh, lots of opinion. An article that uh, does not describe limitations, does not describe ethical issues, and doesn't describe any theory is also fairly weak as far as, as I'm concerned. So every study that we do will have limitations associated with it. Every study that we'll do will have ethical issues that need to be spelt out, I think, for, for the readers. And, and every bit of practice that we do is based on some kind of theory. And, and that needs to be put into an article. We all know what those things mean, uh, but sometimes we forget about the importance of those things when we're trying to put this uh, good article together. Uh, another, another thing that um, irks me, I suppose, is uh, the regurgitated article, the one that's got uh, lots of old literature uh, that might be fit for the 20th century, but not for the 21st century. So when you're presenting something and trying to uh, argue the case that what you found is new or what's different, 
then uh, you need to be sure that your literature is up to date and fit for the contemporary time. So as a general rule of thumb, uh, literature that's uh, more than 10 years old, uh, I would urge you not to include unless it's something that's uh, of seminal importance. Um, so quoting a, a theorist from the 1980s might be appropriate uh, if that's the foundation of your work. Uh, but quoting findings from research in the 1990s would not be appropriate because things change very quickly. Acronyms and abbreviations are another pet hate of mine. Uh, for those of us that are working in a particular industry setting, you know, whether it be uh, in the social services or education or health setting, we, we get used to uh, writing with acronyms because we know that everyone in our profession knows what those acronyms mean. But our readership is not necessarily from your uh, industry experience. And uh, so it's really important, I think, for us to be mindful of our audience, as Jeff mentioned before, and not include confusing uh, uh, acronyms that we, we don't all understand. The other thing to bear in mind with that is that if your article goes out for review and your reviewer uh, has to continually interpret what an acronym means and go back to its first use every time, they're going to get a bit frustrated with that and will be likely to pull you up. Uh, and you're going to have to change that at, at some stage in the future in any case. So avoid acronyms and keep everyone happy is, is one good uh way of dealing with uh, an, an article instead of making it sound like a report. Think about your reader. Uh, what makes this article interesting to them? What would challenge them to think? Uh, is there anything contentious or controversial in, in your article that would challenge conventional wisdom? Uh, is there something about uh, positionality or bias that you you need to sort of also admit. Uh, I'm a non-Indigenous white old man, uh, and so I'm going to be biased by my positionality as, as just that. And so when I'm writing, as I often do, about uh, Indigenous issues in Australia, my bias and my positionality needs to be brought to the front there so that it's recognised by for example, a, uh, an Indigenous reader who sees that, yes, uh, I have been a little bit reflexive. I have worked with uh, Aboriginal team members and I'm writing this with my own biases, admittedly, but I try to address those biases in a certain way. So it's important to bring those things out. And finally, is this an article that you would cite yourself down the track in another article? So is this something that is worth mentioning uh, elsewhere. And I mentioned before that a good article is something that is well read, that is well written, and is well cited. And that's something that's, that's uh, worth considering as you wrap up your article. Article titles are also important. Um, if you uh, are wondering what should I title my article, uh, sometimes it's tempting just to go for something that's catchy, or at least catchy for you, but doesn't necess necessarily describe what you've done. And so if you've got a, a thought in your mind that you want to uh, test out, uh, just type the your proposed title into a Google search or a Google Scholar search and see what comes out. And, and ask yourself, does the re do the results match your field of research does something similar to what you are trying to say in your article come out in the, in the Google search? If it does, then there's a fair chance that your article title is something that will help readers find uh, what, what they want from your article, and then they'd be more likely to cite it as well down the track. So it's uh, you know, the article title will help readers find your work. It should be descriptive, um, and it should... Uh, make sure that it reflects what you're actually trying to say. And I don't know how many times I've, I've seen a title, I've read the abstract, and the title doesn't marry up with the, either the abstract or the actual content. So make sure that they, the title is, uh, 
is connected. There's, there's some evidence to say that having uh, two clauses separated by a colon makes a difference to citations. Uh, I'm not sure about that, but I've read that somewhere in, a, in an article uh, just recently that um, you know having a mix of catchiness with descriptiveness it can be helpful. Um, and I've, I've, I've given you a few examples of, of some of my more successful, I think they're mostly research articles, but uh, you know, posing a question and then putting an answer after it is is one way of dealing with that sort of the two two clauses, having a having a colon and then having a a, a, a catchy phrase might might also work, um, but uh, uh, in in general, uh, try to be descriptive, try to use words that reflect the keywords of your articles and the try to, to reflect the content of your articles. You might also be talking something about the evaluation design in your title. So, you know, you might describe uh, this as a realist study in, for example, which describes something about the, the design of the evaluation that you are talking about. And again, avoid acronyms, uh, even though they might be common to you, they, they won't be common to uh, readers who don't know anything about uh, your particular acronym. So uh, avoid acronyms in the title, unless that's going to increase searchability, of course. So, um, uh, but by and large, you know, an acronym that describes a department or uh, a, um, a particular industry specific uh, descriptor uh, won't necessarily work for you. In your submission process, you're asked to provide an abstract. An abstract is just a very brief summary of the, the article uh, that, that tells you um, about the topic, uh, the, the purpose of the article, what evidence uh, you are drawing from, perhaps the theoretical framework, the methods that you're using, um, the significance of the work, uh, and uses keywords that draws the reader in. Uh, and Generally speaking, most journals will sort of require this to be no more than a couple of hundred words. Uh, that doesn't leave you a lot of space to be able to do all of that, that work that, that's described on that slide. But if you use your words wisely, it's, it's not too difficult to create an abstract that covers off on all of those particular uh, issues there and provides a clear argument and a clear picture of what it is that you're trying to do. So the abstract can be really important. I know for myself, the first thing I will read, apart from the title, is the abstract. The second thing I'll read is the conclusion in an article. If those things are the things that I'm looking for, um, wanting information about, then I will uh, continue reading onto the, the bulk of the, the article. So um, a lot of the times I, I read articles and they're very verbose. They use a lot of repetition. They use long, flowery, adjectival descriptions, which um, aren't necessary uh, to actually describe what it is that you're trying to talk about. And one of the things that I think we should all avoid in writing is using the the passive voice, uh, you know, turning something around to make it sound like it's objective when we don't need to. You know, the example I've given here is the ball was hit by the boy, um, which makes a lot more sense if you say it the, the correct way around, which is the boy hit the ball. Um, and uh, so avoiding the passive voice and using an active voice reduces that floweriness and uh, it makes uh, the reader uh, able to understand much more quickly what it is that you are trying to say. So be succinct. Don't use unnecessarily flowery language um, unless it actually adds something to the, the work. So Jeff mentioned before, don't if you haven't published before, don't try to reinvent uh, the wheel. Don't try to reinvent the standard structure for an article. Uh, 
articles um, uh, that that follow this kind of standard structure with an introduction, literature review, some theory, uh, positionality statement, methodology findings, discussion conclusions and references will work fine 99% of the time. Uh, it's very rare that I would actually change uh, the structure of an article to something completely different um, unless it was for a different purpose. This is for an, uh, a journal article, not for a report or a, a minister's briefing or anything like that. This is the standard structure. And a reader will expect to see these kind of headings in your article. Um, and of course, there are those variations based on you know, quantitative and qualitative and mixed methods uh, focuses where you know you won't necessarily have an evaluation question in some studies, but you will have a hypothesis that you're trying to test. Um, so that that might change. Um, and depending on you know whether the focus is uh, purely theoretical, uh, you won't have findings to report in a purely theoretical article. So uh, this is a standard structure, but there are variations within that, as Jeff mentioned earlier on. So one of the things that we need to include in a good article is something about what we already know. Um, we you don't want to repeat what's already known right throughout your article. You need to, to find something that uh, is, is original um, and contemporary. And that's that's what you need to report on in your in your article literature review that you, you prepare. Um, so to find what's already been written about your topic, uh, of course, Google Scholar is a, a very easy way to access that, but I sometimes use a, uh, a library database and sometimes I will use another tool like ResearchGate to, to help me better get a handle on what's already out there in my field, what's been done in the last 10 years that is similar to mine. Uh, now, if you don't have access to a library, um, as a member of the AES, you have access to a number of evaluation journals outside of the EJA. And I'd encourage you to look in both the EJA as a source of information and the other journal articles that you automatically have uh, access to. And then towards the end, what you are trying to do is present something new. Um, you, you might be wanting to challenge your readers. You might be wanting to demonstrate some kind of innovation. You might be wanting to challenge assumptions uh, that, that are behind the work that you've done. Um, so when, when you're coming to a discussion uh, section, you've gone beyond your findings, you've presented what you, you've already found, um, think about how this might challenge practice, how this might connect with theory, how this add, might add to innovative uh, ways of uh, doing evaluation and report on that. Um, it's it's not enough to just present the findings of an evaluation. That doesn't make a good article. That makes a fairly boring uh, presentation of results at the best, but it certainly doesn't make a, for a good article. Tease out the things that are new and different in your work and you'll find that um, people will be challenged to think differently about uh, your, your, your work. Um, there's, there's also a good case for including a strong methodology in, in your article, regardless of whether in your report that you've written about your evaluation, there is a methodology or not. And regardless of whether or not uh, it's a theoretical or a quantitative article uh, or a qualitative or mixed methods article, there's a good case for having a strong methodology that's based on strong evaluation theory and that is based on uh, methods that are, uh, that should be reported and reflected on in the article. 
And uh, the, the methodology should, of course, include a research question or research questions and hypotheses if you are using a quantitative method um, and describe what your analytical approach is. So uh, every article with, a, with only a handful of exceptions should have a methodology that describes what you did and how you've arrived at what you've, you've found. I think um, uh, I mentioned earlier about positionality statements. Um, this is a relatively new thing that sort of seems to have come in, particularly into the social sciences and in particular the qualitative uh, research literature. And it's a reflection of uh, the, the way that I think uh, evaluators are now becoming a lot more reflexive about their position and it acknowledges the, I guess, the difference in cultures that we we come from as evaluators. And so, if 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 I, as an Australian uh, citizen, is working with migrants, I come with a set of biases uh, that I don't uh, even consciously articulate or think about because I'm I've grown up in this country. But for migrants coming from a different country, and if I'm doing something about a migrant program, I need to be aware of the difference in culture that they they bring to their practice and or to their program, and try to reflect that in my reflexivity, but also as make sure that I've got a team that reflects at least in part the uh, the makeup of the the program or the the participants of the program that I'm doing an evaluation article on. Um, so if you're an outsider working with another group, then it's really important to acknowledge that you are different and that you come with different uh, values and different biases. So it's about describing yourself in the uh, in the article. Uh, you might not have seen this before, but I can guarantee that you in increasingly will find it in articles that you uh, are, are coming across uh, the, in the newer literature. Ethical considerations are also important. Uh, we have a policy that uh, the any article that reports on findings should be based on an ethically approved evaluation, unless it's a purely theoretical article, for example. But if you're reporting on findings, uh, then this uh, the, your, your article should not only say that you have approval from an ethics committee, but that you have thought about the ethical issues that are associated with the uh, the uh, the findings that you're reporting on. Uh, if you're working in uh, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander contexts in Australia. Um, having a look at the, the cultural safety guidelines that uh, uh, have been prepared by the AES uh, would be uh, of incredible advantage to you. A reference list is another important thing that, that you need to include. Um, make sure that there's a citation for every reference and a reference for every citation. It's much easier to uh, do good referencing if you've got uh, EndNote or some other kind of referencing software to help you. Um, uh, a little tip, if you uh, if you, you think a reviewer, uh, if, you, you, if, you, if you think a reviewer might like to see their name there because they are an expert in your field, make sure that you've cited them. And um, uh, it, it could just help you uh, have a favourable impression if you if you are uh, citing people that are not experts in their field and have, have ignored the experts, then you can be sure that a reviewer will pick you up on that. So, what makes a really good academic uh, research article? Uh, it's it's one that that really clearly expresses the rationale for why it's important that you write about this. Um, it's an article that has a, a writing style that is accessible. Um, 
It's got a logical, clear structure that conforms to usual academic conventions and keeps the language simple at the same time. It's an article that's got that's based on theory, whether it be uh, uh, evaluation theory or whether it be social theory or both. It's an article that uh, expresses the, the ethical considerations, the risks and the benefits and the cultural considerations that are associated with your work. It's an article that, that has got a uh, clear statement of findings and succinctly presented. You don't want to waffle on. It's an article that's got a, a discussion section that tells about what's new, what what uh, contribution you're making to, for example, ethical practice or evaluation practice or evaluation theory or philosophy. Um, it, um, it's an article that perhaps challenges and makes people think. It's, uh, it's an article that perhaps reports on the failures as well as the successes of, uh, of a, an evaluation. And it's an, an, an article that expresses conclusions that answers that so what questions about what really matters. And it's an article that, that uses references and citations really wisely. Jeff, briefly, if you can just uh, explain the submission process uh, for us, please. Sure. So once you've um, got your nice polished um, manuscript, um, taking account of all the points that John's just been talking about, um, what you need to do is you go online and submit your manuscript. And essentially it comes to the editorial team who have a look at it and decide um, whether to send it out for peer review, which is the usual kind of um, process, um, potentially um, accept it straight off the bat, um, which never happens, um, or to reject it. Um, and also at this stage, um, because what we try to do with our um, processes is to be very um, supportive of publication, if we feel that um, actually th there's some there's some good stuff here, but it's not quite ready, we may send it back to you and say, this, there's some good stuff here, but it's not quite ready. How about addressing this, this and this? And then we can send it out for peer review. So we're going to be kind of um, as helpful as we can at that stage. And then what happens um, when it's accepted into the system is that it goes out to peer review. So peer review essentially means um, two or three other evaluators will, will have a look at your manuscript and offer suggestions, um, offer their view on, on the strengths and weaknesses of the manuscript. And then they send it back to the editors and the editors will then decide um, whether the author needs to do a little bit more work on it um, or whether we can accept it or reject it um, at that stage. It's, the typical process is, is that um, there's some suggestions for ways to improve it. So it goes back to the author, the author makes their changes and then it goes back through the process. So there's kind of a bit of a circular process that goes on um, until until we get to the to a final decision um, which is likely to be that the manuscript's accepted. So if you get back suggestions for change, it's a pretty good indication that people think that there's some um, you know, likelihood that this will get published. So if, if it comes back, even if there's a lot of comments that comes back, um, do, do address them because it's a strong likelihood that um, it's, it will get um, accepted if, if people um, have offered those kinds of views. And so it goes around in that little process, circular process until it's ready. Um, two, two rounds through that process is quite common. Um, sometimes it can be a little bit more. And then, it, as I said, at some point, there will be a final decision made, which will either be an accept um, or a reject. But if it's been around a couple of times and you've been responding well to the comments and improving your manuscripts, as I say, it's likely to be, um, it's more likely to be accepted than, than anything else. And then after the exception, uh, after it's been accepted, it then goes off to um, SAGE for production. And within two or three weeks, it would be available online and people will be able to look at it and read it and um, see what 
see what you've got to say. So that's the process. Thanks, Jen. Um, uh, yeah, it's it's not that complicated. You you put your stuff in, and uh, we deal with it. Uh, we'll let you know when when it's ready, basically, or when it's not. So uh, uh, don't be too concerned about the the the, the flow chart there. Uh, if you need more guidance, um, let's say you, you've got a, a paper or an idea or an outline that you want some help with, uh, then feel free to email us. Uh, Jeff and I are more than happy to sort of engage with you before you submit the article. Um, if you want to you know, read the guidance that's available online, the QR code there will, will take you straight to the, the, the page that you know, gives the author guidelines. Uh, but certainly just talk to us, you know, or, or send us an email. We'll have a bit of a yarn about uh, your ideas and um, and we'll take it from there. And when you think it's ready to be submitted into the system, then uh, it'll it'll be ready. Um, so um, we are not sort of uh, in an ivory tower somewhere. We we, we are practical people. And we, we know what it's like to uh, put stuff into a system and uh, wonder what the hell is going to happen with it. Um, uh, and uh, we want to be able to help uh, AES members to be able to to better put their their uh, their good work into a public domain where other people can read it and get the benefit from it. 